All right, let's go to Hebrews chapter 12. We left off at verse 24, verse 24. I believe I explained each and every word in this verse, but I will do it again, okay? And to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling. So the author is writing, remember the context is about Jews in the tribulation who are in the presence of verse 22, 23, Mount Sinai, the heavenly kingdom, which is the millennial kingdom that is coming to the church of the firstborn in front of God, the judge of all, and to all the saints. So they are in front of all of them, which is why they should be fearful. They have so many witnesses that they will have to speak to, that they will have to stand against if their hearts are not right. But most important of all, the most scary one is verse 24. You're standing in front of Jesus who is the mediator of that new covenant. Remember, the nation of Israel in the tribulation, they will get their new covenant. That will happen in the millennium. That's where they get their heavenly kingdom on the earth. And they are in front of the witness of the blood of sprinkling. Jesus Christ shed his precious blood on the cross. So that blood that is sprinkled throughout the heavens you might recall that at Hebrews 9 and Hebrews 10. So those Jews in the tribulation, if you remember, they always have to plead the blood. They have to use the blood <clears throat> as they undergo the tribulation. So if they live their life in sin or mess up with the Antichrist in the tribulation, that blood will be a testimony against them. So that's why they should be afraid that speaketh better things than that of Abel. So this blood that will be a witness against them is a very powerful witness because it's the blood of Jesus. Whoa. And Jesus' blood speaks better things than Abel's blood. Amen. So in other words, this blood, it does speak out. It is basically a testimony. It preaches. It's a sermon. It's a preaching, it's a testimony, the blood of Abel speaks out, and the blood of Jesus does it likewise. Amen. So, this blood is not just some ordinary blood like you and I. When we die and our blood is spilled, it's not like normal blood being spilled on the ground. Now, John MacArthur, he belittles the blood of Jesus Christ, okay. where he thinks that it's more of the death of Jesus Christ, not the blood. Now, I get it, okay, to be fair to him. So I get it when he's talking about, let's say Jesus Christ had a paper cut and his blood spilled on the ground. It's not something mystical or spooky. But I think that's just an excuse from his part. He, what he's doing, even though some people accuse me of being, uh, oh, what do I say, sensational, and my title is in, on the internet, uh, MacArthur is doing the same thing, but they just give more uh, credit to him because he's nicer than me, I guess. But I believe the reason why MacArthur said something like that, that the people, they're emphasizing too much about power in the blood or the blood of Jesus Christ is something special. He's just being sensational and controversial deliberately so that he can get a lot of attention. So that's what I think. But anyways, the reason why he's still wrong is because doctrinally, that's the more important, scripturally. So the blood is something very special. It's not just the death of Jesus Christ where the act of shedding blood is what counts for your salvation. No, it's not the very act, it's the very substance itself. The blood itself has very special power. It's very important. It's not just the act of shedding blood or dying on the cross. On. So that was, that was MacArthur's wrong scriptural point of view. Because we see right here in verse 24, that blood is speaks. But not only Jesus' blood, get this, Abel's blood was able to speak too. So I don't think it's just some ordinary act, MacArthur. It's more of the substance itself. So first of all, let's go to Genesis. Now, there are three things about this blood that you want to know that's very special. Genesis 4. 
So this was my favorite part that I wanted to talk about last Hebrew study, but I wasn't able to. So there are three things that are very special about the blood that you want to take note about. Now let me know if I'm out of bounds, brother, okay? Okay then. There are three notes about the blood that you want to know. The first one is that Abel, he pictures Jesus Christ. There is no doubt about that. He pictures Jesus Christ. The reason why is because the blood speaks. The blood speaks. But we'll come to that a little bit later, okay? Let's first focus on the picture. Genesis chapter 4. You'll notice that the Bible says in verse 10, And he said, What hast thou done? The voice of thy brother's blood crieth unto me from the ground. So notice right here that when Abel shed blood, the Lord was able to hear the blood crying out to him. And what the blood is crying out to him is vengeance, vengeance. If Abel's blood was a preaching and a testimony against Cain, how is this similar in picture with Jesus Christ? Okay, to prove this point, keep your hand at Genesis 4, and I want you to go to uh, Hebrews 12 again. Let's first prove that the author, he is trying to point out Abel pictures Jesus Christ. Now, there's no doubt that the author of Hebrews, he had that in mind, that Abel pictures Jesus Christ, or he's a comparison to Jesus Christ in picture. Comparison. And the comparison is Jesus is better than Abel. We see right here, verse 24, the comparison, right? Speaketh better things than that of Abel. So there's no doubt about it. So Abel is being compared to Jesus Christ. Can we agree with that? All right. If you don't agree, then you don't know English. Sorry. All right. So go to Hebrews 11. No offense. All right. Hebrews 11. Now look at verse 4. Verse 4. Hebrews 11. 4. We read this before. So I don't know if you remember this in our previous Hebrew study. Hebrews 11. 4. By faith Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous. God what? testifying of his gifts, and by it he being dead yet speaketh. There are several things here. Notice that his blood is a testimony. See that? So it's already a testimony. Two, it's a comparison at Hebrews 12. We saw that. So his death is being used as a picture to compare to Jesus Christ. So he's a testimony. Now, what is his testimony that you want to check out, right? God testifying of his gifts. He being dead, yet speaketh. So when he died, get this, it's not just a cry out for vengeance. If you look at Hebrews 11, 4 carefully, by it, uh, it says, uh, let me read it again. By it, he being dead, yet speaketh. What is by it? By it is God testifying of his gifts. Okay, what is his gifts? It's verse 4, a more excellent sacrifice. What is that more excellent sacrifice? You can turn back to Genesis 4 if you want to, or you don't have to turn over there. But you know what it was. He offered up a lamb sacrifice, Genesis 4, 4. Genesis 4, 4. Notice that Abel offered a lamb sacrifice. That was his testimony. A lamb sacrifice that was what? First fruit. You see that? Lamb sacrifice that is the first. Firstborn. Remember Hebrews, uh, did you forget Hebrews 12, the firstborn? Did you remember that in Hebrews 11? If you forgot, then just go back a couple verses. Church of the firstborn. Remember that? Who's the firstborn? That's Jesus Christ. Abel offered, Genesis 4, you read it, right? Firstborn lamb. He, uh, verse 4, right? Genesis 4, 4. Yes. See that? So it, there's no doubt a picture of Jesus Christ here because Jesus Christ is the lamb that taketh away the sins of the world, correct? Amen. So that's what the author of Hebrews no doubt had in mind. So Abel, when he died, Hebrews 11:4 is trying to tell you 
that his, his death pictured Hebrews 12, Jesus Christ. There's no doubt about that. If uh, you still don't get it, then all you have to do is look at Hebrews uh, 11 again. By it he being dead yet speaketh. What is still speaking from his death? By it, his lamb sacrifice. That's the testimony God used from Abel's death. So his death also pictured Christ's death with the lamb sacrifice. It was a, it was a, it was um, it accompanied his death accompanied the lamb sacrifice. So God took that as a picture of Jesus Christ dying as the sinless, spotless lamb. Hebrews 12 shows the comparison. Jesus death and blood is better than Abel's death and blood. Why would the author say that when he could have used many other people unless Abel he pictures Jesus Christ very well on that. He is very similar to Jesus Christ's death in that matter. He is very similar with his sacrifice, with Jesus Christ's sacrifice. All, all this makes sense so far? All right, so go to Hebrews 12. Here's the second thing about the blood. Now, this is one of Gene Kim's wacky theory, but usually, yeah, usually, <laughs> usually I don't have a problem with people in this church. They usually enjoy that. My, my enemies online, they, they all say, don't, heresy, don't say that, you know. But, uh, but if people in my church love it, I can't help it, right? So I'll just, <laughs> I'm being mischievous, you know, to, the, to my enemies. But anyway, let me give you a little nugget here. Go to Matthew 23 and then Hebrews 10. Hebrews 10 and Matthew 23. Hebrews 9, excuse me, Hebrews 9 and Matthew 23. Now, Jesus Christ, we do know one thing. When he died on the cross, his death enacted the New Testament, correct? Yeah. So remember, the verse says a testament is of no effect unless there is a death, right? Oh, let me, uh, let me do this. So this is activated. Okay, this thing is about to give up the Holy Ghost or something. All right, so maybe it's those seven spirits that Brother Britton used on that pen, so I have to give up on that one now. All right, so. Oh, this has so much spirit in it. All right, here we go. All right. So this is activated by death. The death of a testator activates the testament. So Hebrews 9, to remind us, verse 15, verse 15, And for this cause he is the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. For where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of a of the testator, for a testament is a force after men are dead. Okay, so we know the New Testament is enacted because the death of a testator. We get that for New Testament. Now, what did the author say for Old Testament? It's activated because of the death of the lamb's sacrifices. You'll notice verse 18, whereupon neither the first testament, see that's the Old Testament, was, des was uh, neither the First Testament was dedicated without blood. For when Moses had spoken, okay, that's the reason why we keep saying Mosaic Law for Old Testament, because basically the lamb sacrifices. But here's an interesting thing. Go to Matthew 23. Now notice that Jesus Christ in verse 35 gives you the Old Testament canon. Now, the Old Testament canon for Jews is not Genesis to Malachi. The Old Testament canon for Jews, they go from Genesis to 2 Chronicles, which is Zacharias. He's the last guy. So that's the books of the Bible in order are very different for the Jews compared to us in the King James Bible. Now, they have all the same books of the Bible, don't get me wrong, but the order of the books is different. Now look at the order of the books of the Old Testament. Look what Jesus says in verse 35. That upon you may come all the righteous, what? 
blood. So he shed upon the earth from the blood of righteous what? Abel. Unto the blood of Zechariah, son of Barachias. The Old Test so Jesus gives authority for the Old Testament books based on the blood of Abel to the blood of Zechariah, 2 Chronicles. So who starts the Old Testament canon? Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. Abel. Abel, yeah. Not just Abel, his blood. blood yeah. right. You know what I think? I think that when Abel died, his blood was, uh, was accompanied with lamb sacrifices because... The typology is lamb sacrifice anyway. So, because he, the, uh, there's no doubt, you guys already saw that from the first point. The author of Hebrews had it in mind that Abel is a typology of Jesus Christ with the lamb sacrifices. So if that's already in their mind, then it makes sense why God says the Old Testament can start with the blood of Abel. Why? Because the blood of Abel accompanies with those lamb sacrifices under the Mosaic law. And besides, Abel offered what to God anyway? A lamb. So why don't we enact the Testament? Why don't we activate the Old Testament? That's good. It's very possible the Old Testament could have started even before that, believe it or not. It could start with Adam and Eve when they were wearing sheepskins, yeah. lambskins. But then for a person to die... Who's going to be the first one? That's Abel. Abel yeah. So it makes sense to put Abel as the first one. So the Bible says, Hebrews 10, what did it say again? A testament is of no force until the man is dead. Remember that? That's what Hebrews 9 said. We read that, right? So you can look at that, those verses again. A testament is of force after men are dead. So once Abel died, boom, you can get that Old Testament. So that's interesting. Wow, yeah. Interesting. So that's Gene Kim's crazy theory here. Is that Abel, what's so special about Abel's blood? It activated the testament. So don't tell me the blood is not special to God. See, that blood is so special it activates his, his testament. Now, I, do you want me to go crazy here? Okay, I'll go crazy. I'll just carry on something, okay? I'm just... Throwing in thoughts. I could be wrong, okay? If I'm crazy, I'm crazy. If I be heresy, I be heresy. And if I perish, I perish, okay? But anyway, so if blood activates the testament, a testament is God's word. I'm wondering if blood is necessary for some type of activation on God's word. If it's that important, then think about this. This will come to our third point. That means it might be interesting where... The blood is a powerful substance and an activation where it drives away devils. Now, what drives away devils? Scripture is important, right? Yeah. The name of Jesus Christ, right? Amen, yeah. Why not the blood then? The blood course, yeah. And if from point number two, blood is necessary to activate the word of God or the testament, maybe the same thing with scripture mm -hmm. that we quote. Right. That might be something to think about. But I don't know. I don't know. But there's a lot of interesting things where uh, you do know Satan always imitates God, right? So when you study Satanism, witchcraft, and all those guys, they always try to do uh, copycat what God does. Why is it that dumb Harry Potter movies, which are so innocent for children when it's not, and all these witches, they always talk about blood, and then they put the blood on the book. Like it activates some power. It activates the word. They chant some names, but we don't chant. We use the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. There's something here. I really believe there's something here. Okay? So there's some sort of connection here. Now, there are some losers online who, you know, who just don't have a Bible-believing church because they, they can't successfully plan a Bible-believing church because they're just jerks and nobody likes him or her. So then they just post, uh, all they can do to gain attention is post videos criticizing yours truly about, you know, the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, that it has special powers. And they go, no, that's just mystical. He's just trying to be weird. And sounds like Johnny to me, John MacArthur to me. Mm -hmm. Come on. Now, I believe that it does have special power. I believe in that. And the obvious answer is, one, it's God's blood. 
okay? That's the book of Acts, okay? If it's God's blood, then it has power, okay? If it's deity, it has power, okay? Are you saying deity has no power? So that's the easiest debunking because it's God's blood. But the second thing <clears throat> is when we look at throughout the Bible, there is no doubt that God sees something important about the blood. Let's uh, go to uh, Revelation 12, please. Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12. And I want your other hand to go to Leviticus 17. Leviticus 17. Now, there's no doubt that the blood of Jesus Christ is necessary to conquer devils. The saints in the tribulation, they have to use the blood of Jesus Christ. Now, you might recall that in our previous Hebrew study. That's why the author of Hebrews is telling those Jews in the tribulation about the blood of Jesus Christ. He's making it a big deal because they need to use it against the devils. Revelation chapter 12, notice right here at verse 11. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto the death. Against who? Verse 10, the devil, the accuser of our brethren. So that blood of the Lamb is necessary to overcome Satan. Now, it's very interesting. There were many Satanists, uh, not many, but there are Satanists out there who got saved in the Lord Jesus Christ. William, Sh I think his last name is Schnoabella, and I don't know how you pronounce his last name. But he mentions the importance of pleading the blood. The blood of Jesus is what really helped him with a lot of Satanic oppression that he struggled with. As a matter of fact, he even drank blood. I mean, he was really messed up in the head. He was really into dark stuff. But the Lord delivered him, and what helped him was the blood of Jesus Christ instead. That was a good replacement. It was so weird. I think he even said that he developed some kind of addiction toward blood, which was really bad. So he needed the blood of Jesus to replace that. So only the Lord can deliver him on that one. So he has a... If you type him, you, you'll be able to listen to his life story testimony. Very powerful. Obviously, for children, I wouldn't recommend it. So make sure, you, make sure that you are prepared when you listen to it. But you'll get a blessing out of it. But those people who struggled with satanic forces and talk about pleading the blood of Jesus to overcome devils, you know what verse they use? This is the verse. This is the standard text that you want to use. Revelation 12, 11. Of course, if you're a Medax hyper dispensationalist, I'm afraid for you, all right? If you don't want to, if you can't plead the blood. A lot of them don't even believe in confessing their sins under the blood. That's how bad it is. All right, now go to Leviticus 17. Leviticus 17. Now, notice what God says about the blood here. He says in Leviticus chapter 17, verse 11, that. Blood is not simply forgiveness. That's what a lot of people are thinking. It's just simply forgiveness and atonement. It's a lot more than that. It's something very powerful. It has activation. It has life in there. The, the verse is very plain when you look at Leviticus 17, 11. For the life, see that, of the flesh is what? In the blood. Now, look at verse 14. For it is the life of all flesh. The blood of it is for the what? The life. life thereof. There's something right here. Keep reading verse 14. For the life of all flesh is the blood thereof. That's why Satanists who eat blood, God says, they'll be cut off. He doesn't like that. Why do Satanists eat blood? They think there's power in there. See that? Life in there. You see that there? On, there's something here. No, this ain't some spooky, mystical Gene Kim thing, all right? This is scripture here. Amen. There's something, there's something more to this. There's no doubt that there's some power, uh, there's some life in here. If you uh, look at Exodus 12, this is very interesting when I look at this. Go to Exodus 12. Now, I don't know if this is true or not, but I've heard of some Bible-believing missionaries in Africa. 
where uh, they had some members who were dealing with spirits. Now, you go down there in Africa, you go down there in the uh, Pacific, uh, you go down there to the islands and you're going to see some witchcraft stuff. Those stu that stuff is real. That stuff is real. I even had an evolution scientist who was all into empirical science who went to those witch doctors and realized there is no scientific explanation for that. So even the evolution scientists that I had as a professor recognized that there's something real out there, something spiritual. So with these devils, they had a hard time getting rid of these devils and evil spirits. So what was very strange is this. What was very strange to um, bounce back curses or demonic spirits were two things they mentioned. So I don't know if this is uh, true or not. But one is because they, uh, they curse the place by putting blood on certain houses or properties. And so that's a curse. To bounce that back off, then it would make sense to plead the blood of Jesus Christ on that property instead. Now, obviously, you and I can't dip our fingers in the blood of Jesus and just post it on the door. But there is something here where if you put blood on that property or post blood on that property, it can drive away the destroyer. And the destroyer is two people. It can be God's destroying angel, but also the devil. Now go to Exodus 12. Look at this. This is pretty strange here. <clears throat> in uh, Exodus chapter 12, notice in verse 12, For I will pass through the land of Egypt this night and will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt. Is it strange how firstborn is always connected to blood here? Yeah, there it is. It's strange. Verse 13, And the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where ye are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And then notice that he also mentions, when we look at verse, uh, let's see here, Verse, I'm trying to find that verse. Uh, verse, was it 23? Yes, thank you, 23. This is why I like Bible believers. Verse 23. <laughs> For the Lord will pass through to smite the Egyptians, and when he seeth the blood upon the lintel, and on the two side posts, the Lord will pass over you, and will not suffer the what? Destroy. Destroy. The destroyer to come in unto your houses to smite you. The destroyer is two applications when you read the whole scriptures. One is a destroying angel. The second is the devil himself. So that's very strange when you get the blood on the house. Well, if we can't get the, uh, the physical blood, how do we get the blood? Oh, my friend, you just plead the blood. It's traveling throughout all, uh, all around you in the heavens. Hebrews told you that. Go to Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 10. <clears throat> Go to the book of Hebrews, and uh, excuse me, not chapter 10. Uh, it will be uh, chapter 9. Chapter 9. Verse 22. Now look at this. And almost all things are by the law perched with blood, and without shedding of blood is no remission. It was ne therefore necessary that the patterns of things in the what? Heavens should be purified with what? These, the blood. The blood. But the heavenly things themselves with what? Better sacrifices than these. What's that better sacrifice? That's the blood of Jesus. The blood of Jesus is all throughout outer space there and the third heaven. So all you have to do is just what? Since it's traveling all over there, you just have to pray for that blood to be applied in your house then. Because it's trapped. That's how you apply it. Just pray for that blood, which is traveling everywhere, to be applied on your house. Strike it on your house. Strike it on that curse. Strike it on that demonic object. Strike it on those uh, cursed demonic idols or whatever. Amen. That might be something. Now, a second one, which is extremely interesting, we go to Acts 19. Now, this actually happened. There's a brother who used to attend our church, but 
he actually got a curse from one of his neighbors. So when he was digging up the ground, he actually found all these strange little powders or bags or whatever it was. So then uh, what he did was he actually went to the shop that sells all these charms on all these occultic stuff. And he asked what they were. And that witch told him that somebody put a curse on your house. You know what that witch told him? If you burn that cursed object, it's gonna that curse will bounce back on the person who cursed you. When, when our brother in Christ looked at this scripture, he found a scriptural reason to do it that way. So you go to Acts 19, notice that they burn the cursed objects. Go to Acts 19.19. 19. Look at what they did with the witchcraft stuff, demonic stuff, Acts 19.19. 19. Many of them also, which used curious arts, brought their books together and what? Burned. Burned them before all men. Why did the Bible say in the law of Moses that if you find a witch, you burn? I think there's a real specific curse in there. You know what happened when the brother did that, when he burned it? The neighbor, the husband and the wife, who put the curse on him, the husband got in a car, uh, the husband just got hospitalized, I think, and so the wife got on her car to rush to the hospital and she got in a car wreck. I'm telling you, if you don't believe it, it everyone's so quiet here, okay? I'm telling you, man, if uh, this spiritual stuff is real. That witch stuff is not some innocent Harry Potter kids to play with. Come on, kick that. This is real dark stuff you don't want to mess with. Shall I call him out? Our brother Tom, you know, he actually, him and his brother did the Ouija board thing. And he actually said that him and his buddies were doing that, and then that thing just moved by itself and then predicted the death. And then it was scary stuff. But to my knowledge, I think that what happened was Tom outlived it because of his salvation in Jesus Amen. Christ. So could have died a long time ago, especially if you heard his testimony and his brother's yeah, testimony, yeah. right? Yeah. <laughs> All right, well, anyway, uh, let's go to Hebrews. I love that, brother. All right, Hebrews chapter uh, 12. So uh, there is power and authority here, I believe, with the blood. That, so that's the third thing. The blood has power. When we sing there is power in the blood, we mean for real, man. Amen. If you don't, let me tell you something especially the enemies out there who are criticizing me. If you don't, I think witches do and devils do. They have more sense. The blood of Jesus Christ is something that, um, as, one song go, as one song goes, when I knelt, the blood felt, sin lost the battle, the lamb has prevailed. What made all hell tremble rang heaven's bell. When I knelt, the blood fell. That's where it goes. Amen. There's another uh, song, which is really good. The blood will never lose its power, for it reaches to the highest mountain and it flows to the lowest valley. The blood that gives me strength from day to day, it will never lose its power. Those Amen. songs are real. I don't care what MacArthur and other losers online say. The blood has power. It's for real. Amen. Okay, go to Hebrews again. Hebrews again. Makes you want to plead the blood more often when you pray. Amen. That's right. All right, let's look at verse 25. Verse 25. The Bible says, uh, See that he refuse not him that speaketh. For if they escape not him who refused him that spake on earth, much more shall not we escape if we turn away from him that speaketh from heaven. Okay, let me explain each and every word here and see if it'll line up. So the author is saying, because remember the context is all the witnesses of verse 22 through 24. So you better be afraid. You're in front of all these witnesses, especially that blood, right? <laughs> Where he's talked about its power. So that's a terrible thing. So make sure because of all these witnesses, see to it that you don't refuse him that speaketh. So that's Jesus Christ, right? Because of verse 24, his blood that speaks better things than that of Abel. So don't refuse God. That's the whole idea. For if the Jews were not able to refuse God 
who spoke on earth, that's Mount Sinai, right? Remember the context? Uh, verse 18, 19, 20, 21. Remember that? The author is trying to show you that the Old Testament Jews were scared of God's voice on Mount Sinai. But we, the tribulation Jews he's talking about, should be more fearful of God when he comes with this heavenly kingdom at the millennium. So he's saying, much more shall not we escape if we turn away from him that speaketh from heaven. So we're not going to get away from that voice who's going to speak from heaven when he comes down on this earth and then sets up his heavenly kingdom. If the Old Testament Jews were that afraid of the God in Mount Sinai, so much more when God who comes down at the second advent, when he comes down to set up his heavenly kingdom. Verse 26, whose voice then shook the earth, but now he hath promised, saying, Yet once more, I shake not the earth only, but also heaven. So God's voice on Mount Sinai shook the earth. But God promised now. Okay, he's speaking now to those Jews. I'm not going to shake the, the earth alone, but I'm going to also shake up heaven. So he's going to shake up heaven and earth. Come on. Okay, so that goes by the context of verse 22 that we saw earlier in Matthew 5. God's heavenly kingdom is on earth as it is in heaven. So his heavenly kingdom will shake up all of heaven and earth. So there, that's no doubt the millennium. It's not just going up to heaven. So remember, commentators always get this wrong. They think this is just the heavenly kingdom, meaning the kingdom up in heaven. No, when, remember, the context here of the heavenly kingdom is the kingdom of heaven which is heaven and earth itself, okay, at the millennium. Uh, verse 27, <clears throat> and this word, so uh, he's quoting scripture at verse 26. He quoted a scriptural passage, and he's quoting another scriptural passage at verse 27. Yet once more signifieth the removing of those things that are shaken, as of things that are made, that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. In other words, uh, he sh presents, he signifies, that's what he's doing. He's showing that those things that he removes that are shaken, which is the earth, right? When he removes the earth and these things that are made, everything that is made on the earth or man-made, whatever it is, that uh, the, the things that are not shaken, so the eternal things, right? God's heavenly kingdom, will always stand and remain. So when God sets up his kingdom on the earth, now I guess I'll have to draw it here because we won't have time for those other things. So I'll have to draw it here. If you can raise the temperature one, one or two more degrees too for our ladies. Yeah. So when God sets up his kingdom on the earth, it's second advent. And remember, this is covering the span of not just earth, but heaven itself. And these two are known as the kingdom of heaven. That's the heavenly kingdom. And this takes place in the millennium. So as he comes down the second advent, strikes over here and sets up his millennial kingdom, 1,000 year reign of Jesus Christ on the earth. And then undergoing through this entire span is the tribulation. So the tribulation is covering this span here. Second advent comes down, sets up the millennial kingdom. The earth will be shaken. So the Antichrist earthly kingdom, all those things in the earth will be shaken, replaced by what? The kingdom of heaven. God just replaces everything that the Antichrist does. So there's no doubt this is very millennial. This is very tribulation, end times. This is not church age doctrine. It won't match well unless I, would, I am interested to hear what the commentators have to say. There's no doubt this is all tribulation application. Uh, wherefore, we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved. See that? So these Jews are going to receive that 
kingdom of heaven that is immovable, that is eternal. Let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. So remember the context is that they always have to have grace because they have to endure the tribulation. Remember verse 15? They cannot fail of the grace of God. Remember Matthew 24 during this tribulation? It's all about enduring the tribulation. What do you need to endure trials? What is it that you need to endure tribulation? Problems in life. God's grace, right? So that is 2 Corinthians 12, which we saw in our last Hebrews 20. Uh, last Hebrew study. Oh my goodness, what was that just now? Okay. In our last Hebrew study, 2 Corinthians 12, I explained to you that Paul received God's grace to bear the thorn in the flesh. Yeah. So God's grace is needed to endure. So with God's grace, there is endurance here. There is grace to endure. That's why the author says, let's have grace. And while we have the grace to endure, at the same time, we are serving God in a way where he can accept us. That matches with the context of verse 14, right? Verse 14, we got to be acceptable to God by being ho living holy so that we are able to see the Lord. And in order to do this, good motivation factor is not smile, God loves you. Come on. It's not motivational messages. We live in a day and age people can only do something with motivation, inspirational stuff. Now, don't get me wrong, that's necessary, but you and I need a healthy dose of fear. So in the tribulation, what will help them is reverence and godly fear. So they revere God, but they also fear Him. And that it's a godly fear. See that? It's not an ungodly fear. It's not an unhealthy fear. Fear is a sin, but when you have godly fear, that's a good thing. So you got to fear God. For our God is a consuming fire. So just keep that in mind is that God is a consuming fire. So when the tribulation saints think about God being a consuming fire, remember he's bringing the fire at the second advent. He's bringing hell on earth as well. Y'all didn't know that? He brings hell on earth as well. He opens up hell when he comes down at the second advent. So because he is a consuming fire, that's good motivation to endure. All right, now uh, there are a few passages. We'll just go to one. Go to 2 Thessalonians 1. <clears throat> 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. Notice right here when we look at uh, verse 7, when Jesus Christ comes down at the second advent, notice that he's bringing hellfire with him. 2 Thessalonians 1, 7. And to you who are troubled, rest with us when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with what? Everlasting destruction. That's hell from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power, when he shall come to be glorified in his saints and to be admired in all them that believe. That matches with Hebrews 12, where they see the Lord. They serve him so that they can be acceptable to him in his presence. There's no doubt that it all matches up together. So this is his second advent. Now, when we go back to Hebrews 12... In Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 26 and 27, the verses that he's quoting, uh, I thought that I had a uh, footnote reference. Does anybody have a footnote reference for verse 26 and 27? Is it Habakkuk or Haggai? Does anybody have that or no? Okay, it looks like no one has it. Okay. Y'all, Haggai 2.6? Okay, thank you. I was about to say, y'all brought your Bibles tonight? You know? <laughs> All right, go to Haggai. <laughs> I assume there was a footnote reference, so I'm sorry, okay? Okay, Haggai chapter 2, verse 6, the Bible says, 
for thus saith the Lord of hosts, yet once, see that? It is a little, little while. And I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land. That matches well. Notice with Hebrews chapter 12 and then verse uh, 26. You also notice in verse 7, And I will shake all nations, and the desire of all nations shall come. So notice he's destroying what? United nations. That's what it means. Don't look at me like a tree full of owls. That's what it means. All nations is united nations. Okay? So there's no doubt this is what? This has got to be end time reference. This never happened in Old Testament and even now. So this is all future tribulation. And I will what? Fill this house with glory, saith the Lord of hosts. This house, what's he talking about? That's Jerusalem, where the Jews are at. Where the Jews are at, God's going to fill that house, that temple. So he's setting up a kingdom there, his heavenly kingdom. So that's what the verse is that the author is quote, quoting from. Okay, so let's sum up everything in total. You ready? Okay. So in summing up everything in total, what we've established right here is that Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 through 13, we can see church age reference as well as tribulation reference. So Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 through 13, we've established that the chastening of the Lord is done for God's children, which can be church age Christians as well as tribulation saints. Then in verse 14, we've seen right here that this has to refer more so to tribulation saints, where they can only see the Lord if they are able to live righteously for Him and follow peace. If there's any church age application, it would probably only be the first line of verse 14, follow peace with all men, but not too much in there. So this is more tribulation reference. In verse 15 through 17, we've seen very interesting things about Christian uh, application and tribulation. <clears throat> For the Christian, they are not to fail God's grace, which is God's grace that he gives them to endure and also his blessings upon their life and grace to help in time of need. If they don't fail in those things, then they're able to not be bitter. They're not able to fall away to the world and fear the judgment seat of Christ where there is no repentance there. For the tribulation saint, if they don't fail of their salvation, that's the grace that they have to endure through there, then they won't become bitter because, you know, they're starving to death, obviously. It's easy to get bitter and mad at God. And they have to endure persecution and trouble. And they won't fall away into the world system like Esau, underneath the Antichrist world system. Otherwise, if they don't endure, they're going to find no repentance at God's judgment of the nations when he comes down at the second advent. Verse 18 through 24, we've established right here, it's a fearful thing that the Old Testament Jews went through in Mount Sinai. How much more so with the Jews in the tribulation when he establishes his heavenly kingdom? There could be a little bit of church age application over here with the Christian fearing God at the judgment seat of Christ due to verse 23, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn. But I've already established before to you that this church of the firstborn could well apply to the nation of Israel because remember to get in the church or the body of Christ the nation of Israel could get in there too not just the Gentile Christians you might recall that I gave you that study now verse 25 through 29 we've established here a completely tribulation reference so it is a tribulation saint reference where they, they shouldn't refuse God's voice speaking to them. If they do, then uh, they're going to face God's wrath when he comes down at the second advent. Now it says right here they're going to see him. Did you notice right here that at verse 26, now, see that? Yes. He's speaking present tense. The author is speaking present tense to these Hebrews. Now, if you wrote down or you remember Hebrews chapter 1, and I think it was Hebrews chapter 2, remember those two chapters pointed out the author is writing as if he is in the end times. Okay? 
So I don't know if you all remember that, but uh, if you had notes from chapter one, chapter two, you might want to go back over there. But the author is writing as if he is in the end times. So it makes sense right here in verse 26 when he's saying now God is promising. They are anticipating, see this? They are anticipating the end times to happen any moment and for God to come down at the second advent. So the author is writing as if he is undergoing the end times. So they are writing here that in verse 25 and verse 14, they're going to see God. See that? They're going to see God. Verse 25, he's speaking from heaven. See that? How is it, think about this, how is it that you see God, you hear him speak, and then there's a second advent right there? There's no doubt, if you're going to think about that, there's a rapture. See that? There's a rapture. So, here's the idea. The tribulation saints, some of you know this, some of you don't, but the tribulation saints, they will have a rapture. So their second advent, that's millennium. Because I have no room, I'm just going to draw it like this, okay? <laughs> there is a tribulation rapture. Now, I want you to go to Revelation 11 and Revelation 14. Keep your hand at Hebrews 12 because we're going to see something interesting here. <clears throat> So a tribulation rapture occurs before the second advent. Now, most of you know those rapture verses, so we don't have to turn there. But in the rapture, what happens is that God speaks from heaven. And then you and I are going to see Jesus. We're going to meet him in the clouds of the air. In the tribulation rapture, there's going to be a public event where everyone's going to see something happening. Every eye is going to see God. When he calls up the names of the saints to get raptured up, they get raptured up. And then what's very interesting, because of this raptured event, God is warning all the people to fear God. Due to this rapture, due to seeing God, you better fear God. And believe it or not, that is part of the everlasting gospel in the tribulation. They have to fear God and give Him glory to get saved. Hebrews chapter 12 says, when that voice speaks from heaven, you better fear God and you got to give Him reverence. Isn't that amazing? Verse 28, reverence and godly fear. That matches with the everlasting gospel where you fear God and give Him glory. All right, but anyway, that was a lot, right? So let's go one by one, all right? <clears throat> Uh, Revelation chapter 11. Notice right here a rapture of tribulation saints, particularly two witnesses. Verse 12. And they heard a great voice from heaven saying unto them, Come up hither. Oh, there's no doubt. That's a rapture. And they ascended up to heaven in a cloud. And their what? Enemies beheld them. So notice the people on the earth see these witnesses go up to heaven when they get raptured. Notice in verse 13, and the same hour was there a great earthquake, and the tenth part of the city fell, and the earthquake were slain of men 7,000, and the remnant were what? They feared God. And what? And gave glory to the God of heaven. That matches Revelation 14. Or Revelation 14. Revelation 14, verse 6. Verse 6. The Bible says, And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel, to preach unto them that dwell on the earth and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people, saying with a loud voice, What's the everlasting gospel? Fear what? God. And what? Give glory to Him. <laughs> Ain't that amazing? So the everlasting gospel is preached. That's the gospel Hebrews 12 is talking about here. All right, so that voice from heaven, see that speaking voice. That voice from heaven could be Revelation 14 then, see that? So it could be in Revelation, and that's Hebrews 12 as well. 
So this voice from heaven could be when God raptures up those saints, then that voice comes out of heaven with the everlasting gospel, fear God and give Him glory. And then the, every eye on this earth that sees that, there's going to be a number of them who could possibly get saved, who will fear God, listen to the everlasting gospel, and get saved. If you look at Revelation 1, notice every eye sees Him. Revelation 1, <clears throat> verse 7, verse 7. Revelation 1, 7. Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him. And they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. When people talk about a rapture in the tribulation, there is a rapture in the tribulation. But these are for Jews in the tribulation, not Christians in the church age. Our rapture is before the tribulation. Uh, but that's a whole nother story. I'm not giving in this lesson. You all already know that. So when Jews undergo the tribulation, because the book is Hebrews, right? The author of Hebrews is warning those Hebrews as if he is currently in the last days. That, hey, you better endure to the end. You better keep holding on to your salvation. You better have grace to endure. Because that voice from heaven is calling. And you better fear that. That's more scary than the voice in Mount Sinai at the Old Testament. When that voice comes out, you might miss your rapture. So you're going to miss your rapture. You won't be able to go up to heaven. If those who miss out the tribulation rapture, then they'll have a chance before that second advent comes down where they can get that everlasting gospel, fear God, and give Him glory. That's the reason why in Matthew 25, there are still saved people on the earth who went through the tribulation and go through the judgment of nations. That's the reason why. Those are the leftover saints. The other saints who got raptured is in Matthew 25, which are those virgins. There are virgins who went up, but the other virgins who are foolish were left behind. Hopefully those virgins who are foolish who got left behind, when they failed the warning of Hebrews 12, they start to get their fear of God after that, see? and worship Him. Anyway, so that was an interesting deep doctrine. Let's close tonight. Heavenly Father, I pray that tonight's teaching was a blessing to our hearers, open more of our knowledge to the understanding of the Scriptures, and I pray that we'll hide every word in our hearts, that we may not sin against Thee. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.